uh, depth or do you feel like you get uh, education and learning through breadth or both, right? Breadth is like the expansive, like a lot of information from different sources right. versus like a deep dive of depth. Okay. Um, that's a great question. So I'm on TikTok and sometimes I do scroll. Um, we all do. As I'm sure like, yeah, many, many people do. Um, I tend to get on, it depends what like place I'm at in my life, but I tend to be on more like kind of like news TikTok pages and like um, just like firsthand accounts and like people giving theories and stuff. So... I don't know. I guess like a mixture of both. Okay. I think that it's probably the more I see something, the deeper I go into it. Okay. If that how makes you, any sense. How do you go deep though? Do you do a deep dive with small bits of information or do you like go and like, like if we're talking about something that you're interested in, do you go to the source and then dig? I always, yeah, I always probably start with like a sound bite, And then if I want to know more, I go and dig about it okay. and like find like firsthand accounts and stuff. Okay. I, I don't know though. I will also say that like something that I find happens a lot with the youth is that we get, um, oh my gosh, all the words are leaving me today. That's okay. We get like, um, into our own, when we get like a, a certain algorithm going, you only see that information right. back to you. So sometimes I guess it can be kind of hard. Sometimes I like search up stuff that doesn't go with what I actually think to like mm -hmm. trick the algorithm. So I see different things, but I would argue probably not everyone does that. So yeah, I think it's, it's more like a lot of information about one niche area that each person is getting, but it's different if that makes sense. And when you do a deep dive, do you use, um, are you interested in video and image output or do you actually go and read? Do you read books? Like where, where are you sourcing? I usually just read online stuff. I wish I read more books, but I don't. Um, I just like, I sometimes goes a new, go to news outlets, but usually I try to go more, um, like either I'll look at like TikTokers that I really trust and like kind of watch what they put out or like read what like bloggers or whoever that I trust, if that makes sense. How do you trust them? What's the... That's a great question. Um, I kind of just look, I'll follow someone and I'll see how many of their opinions are based in fact that I can find. And then if it's like pretty consistent, I like slowly build trust with their information. Okay. I used Hold to on. ask my students when they wrote research papers, I said, you can use any source you want, but for every source you use, you have to qualify them. Yeah. So say my uncle who works for the oil industry, or you can say a specific person, but you have to find out enough about that person or that news organization, what their bias is, where they're coming from, mm -hmm. so that your reader can then evaluate why they should buy into this or believe it. And then of course, can look into it further. What do you do, Reagan, to find information? Do you do deep dives? Hold on, I'm writing down what you just said before I forget it. <laughs> I can't write fast enough and I'm writing in cursive. So I'm like, um, I have them similar. Yeah. Do a, you know, they have to go through a database online where we have different sources. And then I don't let them just stop at Wikipedia ever. It's like a starting point for me. So I'll have, there, though. Yeah, yeah. They have to do a deeper dive. I mean, I kept doing that today when people would say somebody's name or a concept, I would look it up real quickly because yeah. yeah. somebody I'd never heard of or like when um, the speaker this morning, I don't know if I wrote it down, but uh, he was mentioning, I couldn't hear what he was saying about two 
two eyed. It was the it was the focus. Oh, two eyed seeing. Two eyed seeing. Two eyed yeah. seeing, and I couldn't even hear. Was it T O? Was it T W O? I couldn't even hear at first what that was. So I looked it up, and and then you know he was kind of defining it, but he kept going to the same. He kept using the same examples. Mm -hmm. So while he was talking, I was looking that up and then reading about it and reading about the three people that coined the phrase and where they came from and what their experience was so that it began making more sense to me. Who were the three people that coined it? They're Mi'kmaq, right? Um, yes. I just put a link in the chat that because I looked it up too, Kathy. It was from Integrative Science. Um, yeah, they but had three different backgrounds. Seen with new eyes. Uh, uh, way too many notes here. Um, okay, so um, Murdana was a clan mother and spiritual leader. Albert Marshall was an environmentalist. And Cheryl Bartlett was a biologist. Mm -hmm. um, and... In the definition, it said viewing the world through both Western and indigenous knowledge and worldviews introduced by the Mi'kmaq. Um, and at least in the definition of it, it was sort of an equal coming from um, indigenous and I don't know, Western or whatever. Uh, Whereas what he was saying this morning, it felt more like it was a, that First Nation people had the ability to see um, their worldview and also with the other eye to see others. And it, it, I wasn't quite sure if he was saying, well, it's the same thing for other people who see theirs and Indigenous. So I was I was curious about that. I but actually anyway. learned about this in school mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. year. And oh, it's, so two-eyed seeing is like the specific term for people viewing the eye from like indigenous and from a Western perspective. But like the general idea can be applied to other cultures. Thank you. Yeah. I came in at a very interesting time. Uh, it sounds like we're trying to reconcile uh, the differences between Western science and indigenous uh, cultural knowledge, it sounds like. Well, actually what the question Reagan had asked Cadence was, when you wanna learn something, where do you go for information? Do you go to short snippets of information? Do you take deep dives into stuff? How do you qualify to decide if it's got any accuracy? And I was saying that as I was listening this morning, um, I had not heard the term two-eyed seeing. So while I was listening to it, I was looking up and I think probably the first thing that came up was Wikipedia. You know, and then from there I went to who were the three people that originated this? Because I was trying to figure out where he was going with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had been talking about where do you get your information? You know, is it short bites and is it online or do you read books? Mm -hmm. So Cadence had given a very good answer and Reagan hadn't answered it really. Oh, right. Um, Cause I ramble, <laughs> that's my problem. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I kind of did. I have students look through reputable databases and then go and try to find reputable sources for their information. What about you? What about me? Oh, I'm a digger. Like, especially when it comes to, um, I don't, I don't trust a lot that I read online. And so, um, I go to like peer reviewed papers, things like that. Um, I like science papers, um, or, you know, I try to do unbiased news sources. There's a, I can't remember the name of the website I found a long time ago, but it had this scale of like, it was during Trump's reign um, where I was trying to find who was telling the truth and who could be kind of in the middle and more neutral because um, there was so much spin and still is a lot of spin. So, um, you know, if something's reported in Reuters or the Associated Press or even Al Jazeera or something like that, I can trust it a little bit more or a science-based magazine, um, 
because I read a lot of that kind of research. What is that one? Media fact. That's it. That's it. You type that in. You really are like God, Terry. She's like, <laughs> this is it. But we don't get to see a picture of her. Yeah. Why don't you turn on your camera? Oh, I suppose I could do that. My office Not is a bit of a mess today. Oh, Hello. there you are. <laughs> It's like that scene in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> now I'm not so mysterious, eh? I could have been anybody. Well, it was interesting. There's literally a curtain behind I've been here and I'm working away and suddenly this voice is talking to me and I look up and there's no one there and I'm going, who is that? <laughs> I do need to chime in here though and tell all of, all of us that this is our core group, right? So one thing Bob Cervelli told me is uh, tomorrow we need to come up with a kind of summary of different topics that that have come up for us and kind of type something up that can be shared. So any impressions, any um, uh, things that people have said, like I just wrote down the conversation, little bits that we just had about um, information. That's going to um, be hard to know what we said in this versus what we said in other things. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, also just like a general impression of like of what we've learned from the conference and things that have come up. So yeah. just to maybe well, that's what we'll do better. tomorrow is we'll yeah. sort of dictate it or something. Yeah. So I'm going to type up a few little notes that I have, um, you know, today and then bring it in tomorrow. Um, cool. I'm probably going to miss the presentation in the morning, just FYI, because it's it's at 6 a.m. For me, so I've been getting up at 5.30 and it's starting to take its toll. So, so I, I was a little late today and I'm probably just going to join the core group tomorrow um, so that I don't feel like I'm done. That's very wise. <laughs> I can barely wake up for nine. So. Oh, yeah. It's been, <laughs> I went to bed at one, got up at 5.30. So Matt, I kept trying to come into the food group thing, but the sound wasn't really good. Oh, it's people. terrible. And so I just thought, you know, I'm sitting there trying to make the words make sense and I couldn't hear them well enough. So I went to different ones where I could hear. Yeah, they put the microphone right next to the crew that was coming in. And like, I assume that they were cleaning plates and like moving silverware around, but it just sounded like two people were just throwing silverware at each other. <laughs> so it was, it was, well, maybe they were was <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Visual. Visual. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you guys met, did you meet in the um, Lobster Factory? Oh, no, you don't know where you met. Uh, I I met the face of Andy Horschnell. And oh, yeah, I saw that to too. And that yeah. actually was sort of <laughs> off-putting to, to, I knew he wasn't there because he was in the other room that I was in. And there's and, a bunch of disembodied voices. And I'd yes. be like, I don't know who I'm speaking with right now, but like, hi. And this is my opinion on this. Yeah. But what were some of the key things that came out of that one? Uh, one of the key things is, I know this sounds terrible. Uh, please, please forgive me. Uh, I, it was part of the meeting where I was like, hey, hey uh, we're all complaining about things. And that's like really cool. I love complaining about things. Don't get me wrong. And I love food so much. I eat it every day. Um, but can we like, can we like just talk about like what, what do you guys think the problem is? Because like we get everybody talking about all the different pains. So if there's like a problem here, we can talk about like, what do you think causes these pains that we're all feeling? Because we're all very vocal about like, I hate this. This sucks. I was even making fun of Justin where I was going, this sucks. This sucks. Government sucks. Everybody sucks. And like, just. Is there like something where you can point at and say, OK, but that, I think that's the problem over there. That that thing right there, that that thing. He's the problem. So were you focusing on problems today and not solutions? Uh, yeah, because I just want to understand like what people perceive as the problem. And then we can figure out what the solution is once when we understand what the problem is. And like just kind of I assume it was Justin I was speaking with. Um, and I was just drilling down on like because like as soon as I said, like, let's talk about what the problem is. Somebody jumped in and started talking about what, what is it like a, a permaculture or something like that for 15 minutes and I was like, okay, so the problem is firmaculture. We need to massively increase firmaculture. Everybody needs to do firmaculture. We're gonna teach firmaculture in schools. Everybody's firmaculture guy now. Uh, no, so then it's, okay, well, what is the problem? And then we, like the more that I just drill down on that, we got like an actual list of like, from, I assume again, Justin, like, hey, here are seven things that we need. Like it's, the problem is infrastructure in the food scene in Atlantic Canada. 
And these are the things that I think we need to focus on. And is that like, let's be realistic. Is that accurate? Probably not. Is that precise? Maybe, but it's better than nothing. It's better than just talking about pain all the time. So I think that that's good. We like in the, in the, in the void of not moving forward and just talking about stuff that makes us frustrated, we actually were able to point out a thing and say, I think that's a problem, which is great. That that's in my mind, that's progress. So is the word you were using pain, P-A-I-N? Yep. P-A-I-N. Cause okay. the way that like, Again, like I am a, a filthy capitalist. Okay. I know this is, is crazy, but um, the way that I, I build businesses is I go and talk to people about their pain. So I'm doing like what we're doing right now. I go in and say, what's on your mind? How do you feel about that? And just kind of get from their perspective. Cause I'm, I'm going to be learning things. I, I don't know what their world perspective is. I don't know what they feel about things. So it's important that I connect with individuals and just ask them like, What's on your mind about this? And then I sometimes give my uh, feel about it and say, well, this is how I feel about it. How do, how do you feel about that? And we can go back and forth about the pain on a specific thing. Like for example, right now in Nova Scotia, if you were to say, Matt, how do you, what's your pain in Nova Scotia? There's somebody sending me a message on chat. How dare you right now? Oh, you're taking notes and listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but um, if somebody asked me like right now, like what's your pain in Nova Scotia? I would say I am frustrated with Nova Scotia, not the government, not the people, but the aggregate of the food industry. Because when I go to uh, sectors outside of Nova Scotia, across the United States, across Canada, it seems that Nova Scotia is somehow different. Even when I go to like PEI, PEI runs their food scene, I would say considerably different than our food scene here in Nova Scotia, where um, they're far more organized. They have a pipeline to success. Like I can talk to somebody like a food island partnership and I could say, hey, if I want to start a food company, like farm, brand, distributor, whatever, and PEI, who would I talk to? And like, how do I figure out how to even begin this process? And like, if I wanted to succeed to the point where I get to the business to the point where I could get take investors and maybe even sell it off and take a big profit or, or maybe just turn it into a community run entity. How do I do that? Like they actually have like a pipeline to success there. And in Nova Scotia, I ask that and they say, I don't know, man, like just try, try to find somebody that knows. <laughs> and that's a little frustrating for me where I can go anywhere else. It just seems every, no, it's not anywhere. It's everywhere else. I can ask that question. I have a very determined, well thought out, evidenced answer besides Nova Scotia. And, um, I, I don't know what the problem is. I, I, I assume it's a lack of information, but I don't know for certain. So I'm just trying to figure that out myself. And that's kind of my entrepreneur journey. Like right now is trying to find the answer to that. Cool. So I would say the problem from my point of view is lack of information. But when I talk to Justin, I do you he says, use the word pain as opposed to frustration or anger or distress. Good question. Good question. So I mean, it sounds like pain in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> so the way that tech entrepreneurs think of pain is, um, I guess, uh, I guess simply a story is the best way to explain it. I met the guy uh, when I was in Toronto, the guy that actually uh, created Gmail and for Google. And um, when he described, when he went to Google's board and tried to explain to them about what he wanted to create and how he wanted to create it, their board suggested to him, they said, like, it's not that people need to send email, it's people need to have such an insane pain that they feel like they're trapped underneath a boulder. And you're there to solve their problem. And all you need to get from them is just their contact information. They need to feel like completely trapped and, and helpless. And you're there to solve the problem. And all you need to do is get the contact information, because then that that's a success for us. So then the way that I've modeled it for myself and how I find other people in the tech business and, uh, model it for themselves is what is the pain? It's not frustration. You actually have to feel pain. So you can close your eyes and say, man, I, I hope somebody comes along today to solve my problem. And then a tech entrepreneur enters the room. Uh -huh. If I disappear suddenly, the rain and wind have just picked up a lot. Oh, no. And we, well, no, we might be losing power. So it won't be because I'm being rude. It's well, very pretty with all the trees going. 
It's not because you're being rude. It's because you're being carried away by a storm. Yeah, because yeah. like if I'm, I'm I'm explaining something to you and then suddenly <laughs> the, your camera turns off and you just disappear from town and be like, you know what? Like maybe Ka maybe Kathy just not into the, the tech the, the tech <laughs> scene. You know, I don't know. It's like it's like when I'm looking outside right now with this big wind. We have a lot of leaves still on the tree. It's just like instead of 15, 20 leaves cascading down, thousands are coming down right now. Oh, that's um, beautiful. <laughs> it is beautiful. <laughs> but it's going to mean that my picture taking is going to have fewer leaves in it. That uh, northeastern winter is coming for you. No, not <laughs> yet. <laughs> Well, maybe would it help um, if we did some brainstorming right now of 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 of, of what we've been doing? The, the four. It's mostly been the four of us. I mean, I know Nancy was in the first time, but she wasn't really a. Um, it's funny because I've taken notes in all the sessions, but I didn't take any notes because it was just so much more relaxing just being with us. It's just like, oh, okay, this is good. Uh, so what's the objective? Of what we're doing or yeah, of the yeah. whole? Well, yeah. I was, we're supposed to take, we're supposed to come up with, um, I wrote it down. Uh, I think, didn't I? Um, basically to talk about like, um, what we've learned. Oh, oh thank you. Terry God has spoken. <laughs> what new ways of thinking or being that actively embrace life and connection with the living world offer you the greatest hope for the future. So that's what our, that's what we're supposed to write about Terry. That's in the, the document that I have for meeting three. So for today, that's the key question that they're looking for answers. Hi, Nancy. It also said, we'll be looking for each core group to offer a summary statement at the end of the retreat that can be shared publicly. That's right. just the sheet they gave us. They just gave us that? No, it's the, the sheet that was oh. the suggested process for the key questions, and there were key questions for each of the three days. Okay. Um, for me personally, this is what I'm up against. I know that they have a, um, an open mic session tonight, right? Are you in Pugwash, Nancy? Yes. Yes. There, you guys are having an open mic, right? I think the open, open mic is more a, uh, sharing songs and poems and tap dancing because I'm, I'm going to, uh, Bob asked if I could share my film. Yeah, that would be cool. To show like a, how an artwork communicates ideas and stuff. So I need to write a paragraph for that so that they can read it and then show the film. Um, so that's kind of what I need to focus on right now because I, I'm going at one thirty. Um, so if it's cool with you, I think I might <laughs> yodeling, um, focus on that and then I can come up with some notes tomorrow morning to add to the document that that we're doing does that work sure. just like so kind of as long, as you, as long as you give us a link to your your video that we get to see oh sure yeah oh that's right because you guys need it too okay so let me put that in the chat and then I'll just tell you from me right now what I'm going to write to them um so today in our discussion we were talking about art as symbolism and as a way to communicate um, ideas from different perspectives and um, to to create uh, feelings of empathy and connection with not just other people, but also the natural world in, in my case of what I'm interested in. And um, so this piece started from um, letters from young people um, so the young people, I asked them back in 2017, before I came to the conference, if they could um, write a letter to the future, what it would be. And so they wrote these letters that were really powerful. And so then I expanded that project out to people from all different walks of life, including people I met up in the Arctic on a ship. So artists, scientists, people that saw glaciers melting, things like that from pe the people that were working on the ship. 
So the project's expanding. And so I'm going to ask for people to send me letters. So I'll give you guys my address to add to the collection, but also the letters themselves turned into this film. And I completed it the night before Trump's Trump and Biden ran against each other because it was a kind of a protest piece in a way. So um, I'm going to just share that with the group and just show how this is one example of how community comes together, different voices from different backgrounds and the work gets integrated and then goes back out into the world. So, cool. yeah. Wow. So the links in here, similar project. You have your own letter in there. Yeah. I remember you saying that, Terry. That's really cool. That's a, a book, book, right? Yeah. That's awesome. That's how awesome. New Brunswick confronted climate change and redefined progress. So it sounds just like what you're doing. I know I shared the link with you. And yeah. yes, I do have my own letter in here, but I do recommend awesome. it. Did they type it or show the actual letter? The typed. Okay, cool. Right on. Wow. Yeah, I want to order that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pop out and do that, but I will see you guys tomorrow. And will you be there, Nancy, tomorrow? Um, well, I can't promise. The reason I popped in today is I wanted to apologize. For yesterday, we, after the uh, school event, well, we had to have pictures and all that sort of thing. So I just didn't join you. And then today, <laughs> it's, it's really busy and I wanted to apologize to you again. But I also just wanted to tell you a little story, uh, Kathy, because I know you're kind of the historian of this place. Anyway, um, uh, I mean, I share just a tiny little historical note. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, back in 1957. Yes. Uh, uh, I well, I I was in Ontario, but my future husband's family was in Nova Scotia. They were they grew up in they were in New Glasgow. Anyway, my future mother-in-law um, ran the uh, Baptist Church camp, which is right across it is the bay. And uh, she did the summer camps there with girls. That was her her thing. Anyway, it was 1957. And uh, because she was a music teacher, she always had the girls singing. Anyway, uh, along came somebody from Thinker's Lodge and said, oh, we hear this angelic, beautiful singing across the bay, floating across. It's so beautiful. Would you please come and sing for us? And I guess my mother-in-law thought and thought, maybe did a little investigation and found out that it was seemingly only men at the meeting. And she thought, okay, I have this group of girls. I'm not going. <laughs> so that was a kind of sad ending to that story. Uh, well, there were, there were women. Uh... If, if you're yeah. talking about the one where the scientists were there. Well, yes, I understood later. I think she realized she had missed the opportunity. But there were more men. Yeah, uh, she also knew that. I think, well, I can kind of understand her position. She's Oh, sure. And besides, it's sort of more magical if the, the singing is just floating across the uh, Northumberland Strait. Yeah. You know, yeah. the angels. Yeah, that's it. Pretty cool. Yeah. I love those you, stories. My favorite days at the Thinker's Lodge were when people would come in and just give like little snippets of history like that. I love that too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, was, uh, I was in the Thinker's Lodge by myself one night and um, I didn't have any lights on at all. And I was in the great room and I was reading on my Kindle and I suddenly saw someone peering into the window from the deck, which is the great place to see the sunset. And so, you know, I went out and introduced myself and it turned out he had been a firefighter and one of the firefighters that had helped save the lodge when it would caught on fire. So I said, wait, let me get my computer. I'll interview you right now <laughs> and wrote it up. And that used to happen to me a lot. Yeah, um, I didn't realize that the house had been on fire at one point. 
Yeah, there was a fire, I think it was around 96 or 97. And fire people, fire department, firemen and ladies came from four, five, six different places. And it, they think it was an electrical fire. And I was lucky enough to be able to interview the two people that went from the main room up the stairs to the room above the Ann Eaton room. And there was just excessive smoke. And so the first person who got up there um, was overcome by the smoke and couldn't breathe. And they had to carry him down. And then the next two people that went up, one of whom was Lisa Betts, um, they went up and, you know, and, and she was, I had my microphone in my hand and I'm following her as she's enacting, you know, I had all this gear on and I couldn't see and there was smoke everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then the other guy that she was with had a special tool and it's more than an ax, but it's in essence looking like an ax, but it's more than that. And he had to punch a hole through the wall and the window to get enough of the the smoke out so that they could fight it. And it, um, they had rung the bells for the town and everybody also had other jobs in addition to being working for the fire department. And so um, the guy, Bob, can't think of his last name, who was head of the fire department, he'd been teaching a history class and he just left when the bells rang. And then the principal goes in and takes over his class and um, luckily, some lady had just gotten a video camera the day before. And she went over because the whole they rang the bells and the whole town came and everybody's watching. And she stood there and videoed the whole thing. And I got this video of the whole thing. And she's going, is it on? Is the battery working? You know, is it, it is this battery going to die? And she filmed the entire thing. And then uh, um, they didn't want everything inside to get destroyed. So hand over hand, the people that lived in the village passed every book, table, picture, uh, everything that was in the house. They just did it hand over hand and took it all into the lobster factory and they saved everything. And luckily, you know, it was mostly the floor was damaged and then you know, obviously part of the roof because they had to punch holes in the roof and a lot of smoke damage. Mm -hmm. My goodness. So, it, it, you know, things like, because I used to spend so much time at Thinker's Lodge, people would say, oh yeah, my mom took this video. And I'm going, oh ho. And so I got my cousin who worked for a news channel to go through the video and get stills from it. And I have those in the book and on my website of the you know, different things like the group of people carrying everything out and uh, the different firefighters and the ladders up on the roof. But people were, you know, I remember one time it was Canada Day and that's one of our big busiest days, everybody coming to celebrate and lots of visitors. And I just said to somebody, you know, I'd really like to interview such and such person about the hooked rugs because when there was the fire, a lot of them got damaged. And a group of rug hookers um, spent a long time trying to match the threads on the on the threads going up the stairs. Mm -hmm. and they meticulously recreated the design and they made the stairway treads all the way up. And then after they did all that, they happened to look on the other side of one of the undamaged treads and saw that it had been made in Taiwan. <laughs> But anyway, when I was asking that I'd like to interview this person, someone said, oh, well, that's okay, because she's touring the lodge today, and she's over there. And so I just sat down and typed up the interview. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, it's certainly become an amazing spot, and I think it's the people that made it. I really do. Yeah, that's why I interviewed, I've interviewed 60 people now, so I interviewed the people that worked there. I've interviewed people that worked on when they were rebuilding it. I've mm -hmm. interviewed someone who put on the new, helped put on the new roof, someone who painted it. Uh, when they raised the lobster factory and made a new foundation and it cracked, one of the sides of the walls cracked, you know, mm -hmm. it's another person I interviewed. Um, and so I, I wanted to find the stories of all the people that had worked behind the scenes. 
Mm-hmm. Hmm. But anyway, as a group, should we do a little bit of brainstorming of what I think that what they want is not what we learned. I don't know if that what they want is what we learned in the other sessions or what we did in our own private chat room session. Well, I mean, there's the questions that maybe we could just go through and answer. Okay. And then would that be good enough? Sounds good. Okay. Well, the first one is, who or what are you grateful for and why? Where are these questions? Um, they're on that, the core group guidelines. Yeah, but that was, okay. Yeah, that, that was, that, didn't we? We did, but like, if they want us to have a summary. Oh, of what we statement. said. Sure. Okay. I remember what you were grateful for. Yeah, yeah. Um, do we have like a theme? Because what I said, my hometown. Well, you also um, said um, Sean, the oh yes, and Bob Cervelli, and later mm -hmm. you said your mom. Uh, a lot of things. I'm very grateful. Um, well, should we just if if I mean that could be one way that we did we could do yeah. it. Uh, and everybody could just do that on their own and type it up real quick and then give it to Reagan tomorrow. Mm. Of course, you could just make up stuff if you don't remember because I don't remember. <laughs> I've even forgotten Even what I've ever talked about. When you think about the unfolding state of the world, what troubles you the most? How does it make you feel? I don't think we ever talked about that. No. I <laughs> don't know whether we need to. We're on to the reformatting it. What new ways of thinking or being that actively embrace life and connection with the living world offer you the greatest hope for the future? Well, I think I mentioned about the uh, event at the Pugwash High School. The, the, the youth. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The nuclear weapon oh. zone. Yeah. Yeah. That's that that for me was a singular importance. So I was grateful to Bob Sorelli for getting me involved in the first place. And you were there, right? You went to the presentation. Yes, yes, I was one of the uh, presenters, even because because um, um, Cadence didn't get to go, and it was based on her work. I know. Well, Cadence, your um, uh letter that you sent to Sean Brunt you, you know that was read out yes, yes yeah. yeah yeah and I think um uh I asked someone if they could send that to me but maybe you could send it to me yeah. that could be put in the report because for me that summarizes it yeah um small but mighty <laughs> Bob kept repeating oh. that back to me and, today. And it, and it tells exactly kind of what happened and how yeah. it happened. I really like that letter. Okay. I'm so glad to hear that. Well, but maybe I, when I was writing, I was like, I don't know if this makes any sense. Like if I'm trying to, if I'm getting my point across, but I'm glad that I did. Yeah, you did. Now I can tell you, uh, Cadence said it was kind of, um, well, Sean warned us. It's yeah. the afternoon. These kids... Well, <laughs> they're not very awake. It's Friday afternoon. Yeah. They're waiting for their bus, um, and and there will things go wrong mm -hmm. uh, because it's a high school. And mm -hmm. what went wrong for us is that uh, the microphone for the students wasn't there, and uh, so I had to run around to each student uh, <laughs> carrying the microphone. <laughs> And which was, we had to use too. So back and forth, back and forth. Um, but actually for me, it was sort of good because it got rid of my nerves. And yeah. And fortunately, Marion, who was on the panel is a um, um, ordained um, minister. And uh, she, well, we didn't have an MC. That was another thing. And she broke the ice with that group. They. They weren't going to ask a single question. They weren't going to yeah. mouth a word. It was 
they were <laughs> but then as soon as we uh, uh, got them going they it was fine it was good that's so great yeah I know sometimes in like those settings it's hard especially to get the juniors to talk um, but I'm glad that you were able to break the ice and that people had questions and stuff yeah my little yeah. sister was in that crowd um she was a grade seven and she was she thought it was really cool so she thought it was cool you, yeah you yeah to- she was a little confused but <laughs> she's a friend? great as your sister or a friend yeah yeah my your little sister who's in grade seven oh, okay yeah yeah because the grade seven the younger ones went to another room mm-hmm. oh, okay yeah. yeah so we there was divided so mm-hmm. I was with the older group and the younger ones went off and then they came back together and that's when Sean presented it okay yeah and I have a picture I have a picture of the uh, um you know the uh, box where everybody puts their signatures so I don't know do you want me to send that picture of the box um actually if you could that would be great I I've seen it in person but I don't have a good picture of it okay Okay, so um, let me see. Would you put your yeah you sure your emails in the chat or something? Nancy, I really tried to come um, when they had the breakout sessions yesterday afternoon to to yours because yeah. that's actually been my key focus all these years is um, uh, nuclear disarmament. But they, I couldn't get in in the afternoon. You know when we could go and hear what had happened. Oh, okay. Well, I uh, my session was in the morning. I know, but then they had uh, yeah, but that. no one was to, there to report because I was oh. at the high school. Ah, okay. that would be why I couldn't find you. Probably, yeah, that's probably why. But I'm very disappointed that I didn't get to hear what was said and to hear you. Oh, and... uh, well, you know what? I can send you. Uh for what it's worth, the little fact sheet that I made for the students and also a report that our organization made. Um, cool. Yeah, okay, now. I'll I'm send sending you my email. Yeah, and I've got to make sure I copy, okay, mm-hmm. all these emails. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was nice, uh, I got taught yesterday how to copy. You can copy the whole, save the chat, but I don't know where it's saved to. Matt, That's must- okay. I can send along. I'm saving the chat right now and oh. I can send that along. Is that the voice from above? Mm-hmm. That Thank is the God. voice from above. Okay, if you, if you would do that, Terry. Blessed that- be those in the breakout rooms. <laughs> okay. That would be great. All right, so that's ready for a hard stop. Will we see you tomorrow, Matt? Yep, I'll be here. What time do you need me to be here? Oh. Uh, Let me look at the schedule. It does start at nine with the elder, and then a final core group meeting is due to start at 10.30. Okay, perfect. I'll be here at 10.30 tomorrow. Cool. Bye. See y'all then. Have a good night. Good night. Enjoy the tap dancing, open mic, uh, yodely, yodely, yodely. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good one, folks. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.